Hey guys, what is going on? It's me, Box 12 here, and welcome back to another Realm of the Mad God Dungeon Guide video. Today we'll be taking a look at the Mountain Temple, a fairly high-tier dungeon that came out nearly three years ago now, dropping from the Jade and Garnet Statue Event Gods, and has since gone through a couple of reworks. I originally held off on making this video in anticipation for the fabled Second Wing that was supposed to expand upon the temple in a part two of sorts, but since that still hasn't happened, I figured now was as good a time as any to cover it. Let's get one thing straight right off the bat. This dungeon is beautiful. This has to be one of the most compelling dungeons when it comes to motif and theming. I love the contrast between the very clearly Japanese indoor and outdoor set pieces and how well it fits within Realm style. And that was pretty much how everyone reacted at first. We all loved the presentation, but when it came down to actually doing the dungeon, not so much. Perhaps my memory is a bit faulty there, but I feel like nobody ever wanted to do these. They either took too long or you'd walk out empty-handed, so I typically skipped out. In any case, times have changed, and after soloing four of these back-to-back -back on three different classes, I've come to the conclusion that the Mountain Temple is not nearly as difficult or tedious as I once presumed. On the contrary, it was rather enjoyable. Like nearly every other dungeon in the game, following the room-by-room -room luring method is a foolproof way of getting through. With a few exceptions, all of the enemies are only lethal at close range. The wizard quickly became my preferred character due in part to this range of lethality. Five out of the seven enemies can be dragged out of their rooms and will never catch up so long as you have room to back up. Of course I wouldn't recommend soloing this on a fresh level 20 with low speed and DPS, as the technique won't work as well, nor would it be worth the amount of extra time you'd undoubtedly sink into it. But a small group of three to four level 20s, or a single maxed character on attack, dex, and speed is more than sufficient, assuming you can pick up on how everything operates. That's not to say melees can't do this, not at all, but Against enemies like the Corrupted Spawn, you'll naturally have more work cut out for you because you actually have to dodge these tightly packed projectiles that armor pierce that high defense. Aside from the knight being able to stun everything except the boss, the advantages of using a melee are outclassed by the sheer lax playstyle of the wizard, who can pick off enemies one by one at a safe distance before they even get a chance to become a threat. You can also often see into other rooms over the walls, allowing the spell bomb to get the drop on unsuspecting foes at no risk to you. This works wonders on the stationary Corrupted Armor Armor who's just asking to be perfect spellbound. And the staff itself can even curve around walls to hit certain enemies at just the right angle, although that is somewhat situational. Keep in mind though that they do have to already be activated for you to inflict damage. Shooting at them while sedentary won't wake them up, you have to get close enough to trigger it. The armors and mini armors are the only ones not immune to stasis, so mystics don't especially thrive here, but the curse effect is guaranteed to apply. And the casters, monks, and spearmen are all immune to paralyze, so huntresses and archers with a slowing would be a good second pick, but I still think the wizard covers the most ground while retaining that iconic ease of use. Corrupted casters have two attacks, a big red 120 damage spear that aims at your current location and sometimes predicts your next move, but it's not very accurate or consistent, so I found this to be pretty easy to see coming, although the hitbox is wide. The second attack is the one to watch out for, a 10 shot radial burst where each bullet confuses for 1.5 seconds and has 95 base damage, totaling to 950 should you sit directly on top at the wrong moment. However, when applying the average 32 defense of a maxed robe class, it becomes 630, which is still bad news for players without maxed life, defense, or any kind of health ring, but the likelihood of getting popped in an instant from full health is lower than you think. It's far more plausible that you would take a few hits, get confused, and then accidentally sit on him. So the real goal here is to not let these pink shots get too close. The first couple of rooms in the mountain temple have a good amount of space compared to most, so assuming you're clearing everything and don't drag too many enemies, you should always have a safe zone to back into when pulling them out. By the time you would run out of space, the minions should already be long gone. It is possible to circle the casters, but I would not advise that at close range for obvious reasons. Drag one at a time, focus fire, and you'll be done in a matter of seconds. Stay away from corners and walls as much as you can. If you lose track of where you are and get caught on something, it can spell disaster. The Corrupted Bowman is a little easier to handle. It has an 80 damage double bow that fans out and a single 165 paralyzing shot lasting a full second. These guys used to be way worse. If there were two or three of them in a hallway and you got paralyzed, they could drop you in a flash. Thankfully, they have since been patched and now have a three second cooldown before the next arrow will fire. So while paralysis is still present, it's no longer a guaranteed nexus. Dragging and strafing works fine as always, but circling is actually the easiest method if you can pull it off. 
itself. The Corrupted Spearman can be more problematic due to how fast it charges you with a slowing attack no less, but if you can keep your eyes peeled and react right when you see them run into frame, you can lock them in a circling loop like the others, or just run back and strafe if you have the speed. But they're a lot more erratic than the bowmen are, so you'll need to match that pace. The Corrupted Monk can be quite the irritation, since it always maintains a mid-range distance from the player, and hobbles around in the most unpredictable fashion it could. It has a fast 5-shot spread, each hitting for 75 damage, and petrifying for 0.6 seconds, which was a new status effect at the time, placing your character into a stasis where you're still susceptible to damage. So, in a way, it's the most debilitating debuff there is. Luckily, it's a very short duration, and for all you know, he might not even decide to use it. I swear, the monk just chooses when he wants to attack with no rhyme or reason to it. I'm pretty sure you have to be somewhat close to him to trigger it, but it's still random, and he even fires backwards sometimes. An interesting little detail is that when he fires, his eyes shut. Not quite sure what the implication is there, but that's kind of cool. Ideally, I would lure out any other enemies from the same room as the monk to isolate him and then push him into a corner where he can't wiggle his way out. The corrupted spawn is quite simple at long range. It has a single, double, and radial shot pattern, each hitting for 60 armor-piercing damage that cause pet stasis for 5 seconds. Although, like the monk, it's unclear which of these three attacks will be thrown out. It just seems to change from moment to moment. At a moderate distance, you'll have enough space to move in between the shots to pass them by, but on melees, you have a much smaller margin of error. Shooting while dragging is your only realistic option to avoid damage, but being in a hallway can actually work to your benefit, as it keeps the minions in line and can block some of their shots. Finally, we have the Corrupted Armors. They're surrounded by a few mini armors that you can drag out, who each have a 75 damage armor-piercing triple shot, but the wide gaps make it easy to dodge even while up close. When they're taken care of, that leaves the stationary armor itself, and I've seen many players struggle against these for good reason. They attack in a very odd timing that changes ever so slightly depending on your distance and positioning. The red aura attack is really just for show, it only does one damage a piece and is so short ranged that even melees won't be close enough to sample it. It's the 75 damage pink shot that comes right at you that will be the thing to keep you quiet. One thing you should know is that circling works 100% of the time. The problem is that they're often up against a wall or placed in a room where there are two or three of them. They also have a really long aggro range, so double check your safe spot if you start camping to regen some health. But in a standard one-on-one -on -one showdown, most players will see how high the statue's rate of fire is and think that they have to copy that pace. So they'll dodge the first attack and then quickly backpedal to try and juke the second, only to wind up getting hit by it anyway. And the reason for that is because by the time you've dodged the first bullet, the second one is already on its way near where you were just standing. So ideally, you want to stand about four to six tiles away, give or take, wait for that first shot to get right above your character, then move left or right to evade. When slowing down the footage, you'll notice that the second shot comes out right as I start moving, meaning it'll shadow the same path as the first. So when you're stepping off to the side, you can sit there for a moment and wait for both to pass. But then you gotta do the same thing only for the other side and keep repeating that. It's a very precise one-two dodge movement, but when done right, it works. It really works. Sometimes there will even be a rock in the room that you can stand behind to block its projectiles, and use your staff and spell to get around it. It's up to RNG whether or not that happens, but it's a nice surprise when it does. In the event that there are two of these statues next to each other, this method still works, believe it or not, but the timing and positioning changes depending on where that second armor is positioned. Your window of timing just became a lot more rigid, and you may have to do some zigzagging to get by. If you have some time to kill, you can always practice against these guys as long as you see fit to try and nail the pattern. Now, if there are three in the same room and they're all spread out, well, then we may have a problem. You're gonna have to either cut across the entire room, then back out in an arcing shape, or circle the whole room if possible, because when there are that many armors in one spot, you cannot retrace your steps without getting hit. And the terrain doesn't always lend itself well to that situation. It is, however, all possible. It's chaotic, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't the fun kind of chaotic. When it comes to using a melee here, this technique is actually a lot more simplified, albeit more frenetic. If there are two or three at once, then yeah, it's gonna be messy like before. But on a single target, because of how close you are, you have to dodge each and every one of the pink shots. So the timing hasn't changed, but the frequency has. You gotta bounce back and forth at a rapid rate. Realistically, these enemies shouldn't give you that hard of a time, especially if you're okay tanking a couple shots. But when you sit down and actually try to avoid all all the damage, you realize how complicated and precise it is. The Mountain Temple is not a particularly long dungeon. In fact, it's kind of on the shorter side when compared to the Abyss and Sewers. Which is not a bad thing, mind you. I think any longer would border on tedious. As long as you take it one enemy at a time, it's a relatively easy clearing process for a dungeon of this caliber. I was surprised at how little damage I had taken when the whole thing was done. Yes, everything does hit pretty hard, and given the chance, can prove lethal, but with a pinch of focus, 
it's all avoidable. Even the boss was way less scary than I remember it being when it first came out. Most likely because they did tone down his final phase a bit. You'll see these glowing purple cracks in the ground on the way in to show the corrupted power that has infested the temple's leader, Daichi the Fallen. The Mountain Temple is kind of a messed up place. It says that an order of monks hide among the realm's sheer cliffs to isolate themselves from Oryx's tyranny far below. They pray to a powerful demon lord for protection and guidance. In exchange, they slaughter any living beings on the mountain and offer them as sacrifices. So first off, these monks have nothing to do with Oryx. They want to get away from him as much as we do. But it's unclear whether or not they are genuine savages and are choosing to offer people as sacrifices voluntarily, or if the power of this demon lord is manipulating them. After all, every name in the dungeon is preceded by the word corrupted, and the boss is called Daichi the Fallen, implying that something has taken them over and they have since fallen from grace. But enough about the lore, let's get into the boss fight. After walking up to Daichi, he'll move to the center and vanish to go light the four flames at each corner. Fire, earth, water, and air. Or red, green, blue, and black. Afterwards, he returns to the middle and immediately sends out this lavish array of bullets at which he is completely untouchable. So you can just chill out in the hallway and wait for him to be done. He'll then begin teleporting to each of the flames in this order. Blue, red, black, then green, and he'll send out five attacks for whichever one he's currently at. Every shot pattern is the same, but the status effect is different for each color. Blue slows, red armor breaks, black paralyzes, and green bleeds. The position of these flames will also remain constant for the whole fight, so the paralyze and armor breaking shots will always be at the top, away from you. Now, the interesting thing about Daichi's fight is that you can dip out at pretty much any time. There's nothing forcing you to engage. Yes, if you want your loot, you have to kill him eventually, but if you don't like how a certain phase operates, you can wait for him to transition to the next one and deal damage then. And this teleportation phase is one of those times. There's a gap that always opens up on the far left and will rotate 180 degrees clockwise over five bursts. So if you have the order memorized or you look on the minimap, you can run into position and do a half circle around it to get some damage in. But what you'll see almost all of the time is players camping at the bottom waiting for him to TP nearby and then tank the slow and bleeding shots. You're technically missing out on some DPS, but since the phase is infinitely repeat, you can save yourself the half and wait until it's convenient for you. Plus, the timing to get into position for the upper two flames is really strict. If you get hit once by the black shots, you'll be chain paralyzed. At the end of phase one, Daichi returns to the middle and will send out three rounds of a big triple shot for 280 damage apiece. This is his most powerful shotgun that you will see throughout the fight. He's vulnerable for about five seconds and then goes back to his spiral attack from the beginning and proceeds to light the flames all over again. It's a fairly intimidating attack at first, but there's a clear way to fake it out. Or if you have the range, you can wait for a gap to open up. This is where trickster decoys come in handy quite a bit, or even an archer with Quiver of Thunder is a tremendous help. It's phases like this that can make Daichi a touch on the anti-melee side, but because you can always wait out any attacks you don't like, this only becomes a real problem in the final phase. When pushed into phase two, the four flames will light back up with very specific player piercing attacks that you can, once again, skip entirely by backing into the hallway. Then the triple shot will come back with a new small weaken attack, giving our poor melees an even greater task. You can wait for the first four waves to pass you, since Daichi isn't even vulnerable yet. If unprovoked, he'll go back to lighting the flames once again, only this time, the order is black, green, red, blue. So I can't blame you for getting these mixed up. After that, he does the same song and dance from the end of the first phase. Three rounds of the pink shotgun, flame spikes, etc. When phase three hits, you'll know it when you see it. There will be four masks and petrify shots that will no doubt catch you off guard. But don't worry, while it does last 10 whole seconds, as long as you're not right on top of the boss, it'll wear off in time. Now we have the same triple shot and weakening bullets from before, but now with an added soul blast attack that hits for 90 armor piercing damage and unstables you. It's almost one to one the same as the dazing cursed blast attack in the Puppet Master's Encore. It comes out, pauses a moment, and then flies at your current location. Now, since they move at a similar time interval to the pink shotgun, you can actually knock two birds with one stone and fake them both out simultaneously. But that only works for a limited time before they start going out of sync. We then have the final flame phase that goes green, black, blue, red. And then we get that same triple shot we've seen three times now, you know the drill. In the final phase, Daichi combines all of his previous attacks into one. The explosive burst, the spiral, the weakened shots, the soul blast, but not the triple shot. When I was soloing these, I thought I remembered this phase being a lot harder. Turns out that's because when the Mountain Temple came out, Daichi did used to combine all of his attacks here, including the triple shot. But Dekka most likely thought it was too difficult and too anti-melee, so it was eventually patched out. Now what we're left with is still an incredibly dense 
intense field of projectiles, and avoiding all damage on a melee is quite the tall order, but it's doable. But bring a sea sword if you can. I can't stress enough how much of an advantage the wizard has here. Not just because of the long range benefits, but Daichi is always sitting still making him the perfect spellbomb target at all times. All you have to do here is move in the same rotation as the spiral attack and change direction accordingly. If you don't want to stray too far from the hallway, you can run up, get a few shots in, back up, go to the other side, and repeat. For melees, you'll have to do the same general strategy, but naturally a lot closer. A good time to run in is right as the soul blast is passing you. That'll give you the optimum time before the next one comes out, and because of the burst attack, you won't be able to stay in there for long anyway. If you plan to play it safe at long range, poking your head in here and there to attack, you'll figure things out really quick and it won't give you too much trouble. When you've dealt the finishing blow, Daichi will swell to an immense size and his soul will leave his body, only to be taken away by the hand of Zill. You can technically save him by destroying his body fast enough, but I don't think it changes anything. He'll drop a guaranteed defense potion and one other stat pot that isn't mana or life. Some decent high tier equipment, two pieces of the Akuma Slayer Samurai ST set, those being the Kazukiri and Kamishimo, and our two white bags, Wand of the Fallen, one of the highest DPS wands in the game, and the Orb of Aether, which lays out a temporary aura effect on the ground, slowing and paralyzing enemies within two separate tile ranges. They are definitely worth any trouble this dungeon may give you. But wait, we're actually not done yet. After his defeat, you unlock the path to Daichi's private study. But to gain total access, you need to light up all five lanterns found throughout the temple. Just hit them a few times, and once you get them all, you'll find the old chest sitting in the room that stays invulnerable for a little while to give players a chance to run over. It sadly does not drop any white bags, but this is where you can score the other two parts of the ST. All in all, that is the Mountain Temple. At least, the first wing. I know I'll be back for more when that second wing opens up. Whenever that is. With that being said, thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, don't forget to check out the next episode whenever I post it, which will probably be soon. Alright. See ya.